Well, I have to tell you, I've been excited about what I'm going to be sharing with you this morning. I'm, I'm always excited uh, about sharing the Word of God. I just I love the Word of God. But this morning, I want to talk to you about the local church. And I love the local church. I mean, I love the body of Christ, but there's something special about the local church. The local church is a manifestation of the body of Christ. You know, you don't really see the body of Christ because the body of Christ is just spread out everywhere. But a local church is a part of the body of Christ that comes together to worship and learn and serve together as a small family, if you will. And sometimes I hear people say, I just love my church. And I think that is awesome. I especially like it when I hear somebody from Crosswalk Fellowship say, I just really love my church. And I've seen that on Facebook before, and I've, I've heard people say that, and, and uh, that just does my heart good because that means they are connecting to the church. And the church is meeting their needs at some level because they have this love for the church. Now on the flip side, no church is perfect because it's made up of people, amen? And in like manner, no family is perfect. But in essence, a local church is family. For many, the local church is more family than their biological family in many cases. I, we like to say it this way, you know, we're a small church, big family. And I really uh, enjoy that. But just as no family is without issues, uh, no church is without issues. But I am glad to report that going on nine years, to my knowledge, Crosswalk Fellowship has never had a major issue. It just, it's just good to my heart. You know, most churches cannot say that. Matter of fact, I was just at a church not too long ago, and you could tell that they had gone through some things. And that hurts so many people when you have church issues. It, it just affects more than, than what anybody would ever know. You know, there are many believers that have been hurt by people in the church to the point they just gave up on church and quit going to church altogether and you know, there are some of you, or there are some that are part of this church that have been in that situation. They've been at a church and, and they've gotten hurt in that church and perhaps even stopped going to church. But I'm so thankful that you gave church another try. And I believe with all my heart that when you came to Crosswalk Fellowship, you found a loving and supportive family. Are we perfect? No. But you know, you're not going to find a perfect church. You're not going to find a perfect person. Amen? And by and large, that's why you won't find a perfect church because no one is perfect. But I will say this. We try. We try our best to be the church that God wants us to be. And I believe we all have to admit that we feel the love at Crosswalk Fellowship. That's one of the reasons our motto here is a church that loves you right where you are, a healing place. And that's our desire. That's what we want Crosswalk Fellowship to be. And I pray that we will continue to, to live up to that as we grow. And church, we will, and we have grown, but we will grow much more in the days, months, and years to come. And I pray, as we have always prayed from day one, that God would protect the unity at Crosswalk Fellowship. And I believe God has done that. That's why I believe that in all this time, had there maybe been a little issue here, a little issue there? Yes, but you know, it was nothing of a major consequence. It's nothing that people as mature Christians cannot go, you know what, what does that matter in the light of the scheme of things? As your pastor, I desire to do church right. That's my desire. Will I make mistakes as your pastor? I'm sure I will. I'm sure I have. But 
I hope you know by heart that I want to do things right. I want Crosswalk Fellowship to be the greatest church in Evansville, Indiana. Amen? And I hope every other pastor feels the same way about their church. I love the local church. We're given a model of the local church, and we're going to read about that model here in the next few verses. And that's what I want us to look at this morning. Our mission as a church is to love people unconditionally. That's pretty strong language, isn't it? To love people unconditionally. Now, that doesn't mean that we approve of everything somebody does. Well, brother, you can't point out what I'm doing wrong. You can't point out my sin because you're supposed to love me unconditionally. Well, you know, I can love you unconditionally, but still recognize sin in your life. And because I love you, tell you about that sin and what it's going to do to you. Someone once said, and I've shared this before, I cannot remember who it was that, that said it, but they said sin will cost you more than you want to pay, take you further than you want to go, and make you stay longer than you want to stay. Sin is not to be ignored. Some people think we're just to ignore sin. There's a lot of that going on today. Don't ever talk about sin. Don't point out anybody's sin. Just love them. You're not really loving them if you let sin take them down a road of destruction. Good place to say amen, everybody. Amen. Our mission is to love people unconditionally. But to ignore sin would not be biblical. We are told to tell one another the truth. Now here's the key. We're to tell them the truth in love. In Ephesians 4.15 It reads there, but speaking the truth in love. There it is right there. We're to speak the truth in love. May grow up in all things in the end who is the head of Christ. You see, you can't grow up. You cannot mature as a Christian if you will not open yourself up and allow yourself to be uh, uh, mentored or discipled or allow someone to speak into your life where they see you going in the wrong direction. We can't just ignore that. Or else the enemy would just have his way with that person. We are to speak the truth, but we're to do it in love. If you see a brother stumble, we are told from the Word of God, we are to restore that brother. We're to bring them back to God. Matter of fact, Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1. It reads, Galatians 6, 1, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one. Now listen, restore them. Tell them the truth, amen? But here's how you do it. You do it in love, but here it says, in a spirit of gentleness. In other words, we're not to be harsh. Now sometimes you do just need to smack somebody upside the head. You know what I'm saying? Especially you know somebody that you have a relationship like that with. What are you doing? Maybe not that hard. What are you doing? Wake up. You know better than that. Nothing wrong with that. If you had that kind of relationship with them, amen? But you got to know your relationship. they got to know that you care for them. they got to know that you love them. they got to know that you really are praying for them before they're going to receive and respond to your word of rebuke. Well, we don't like that in the church anymore, do we? You know, the pastor, you can get up and, and, and rebuke the congregation for something. You can lose half of your congregation. Well, you're just legalistic. I'm going to go down to the church down the street where they let me do what I want to do. That's the age we live in. We're not to ignore sin. Now, I agree sin should not be our focus. I don't think I need to get up here and talk about sin every week and how, how far short you're falling and, and, and where you need to be. I don't think you need to do that every week. 
but it cannot be ignored. Yes, I believe we're, we're to talk about Christ. We're to talk about His resurrection power. We're to talk about the goodness of God and the love of God, and His healing power and delivering power. But sin cannot be ignored. Amen. We must examine our own hearts before we address somebody else's sin. Amen. But you have to understand it's the motivation that we have that counts. And don't go talking to everybody else about somebody sin. The Holy Spirit puts it on your heart to pray for them and address it. You go to them in love, having a relationship with them. Not, well, I will tell you what I think what you're doing is no. You do it to restore them. Amen. Our motives must be pure. And another thing, we're to do it prayerfully. Make sure you spend ample amount of time praying for that person. Do you need to address it every time? No, sometimes you just pray for them. You know, you don't have to go tell everybody, man, I'm not telling you to be sin detectives. You know, some people think they have that gift and, and they get way off. The best thing to do is pray for them. If you see they're not turning and they're, and they're heading in a dangerous direction, just like if you saw uh, uh, someone heading down a road where the road's missing, you're going to go tell them you're about to head into disaster. Yeah. I shared this story before, used it as an illustration in a different area, but I remember back when I was about 19 or 20 or something like that, I was riding my motorcycle in the middle of the night. I was coming home from work, actually. And I'm going down Ohio Street, down by the river, and all of a sudden this crazy person just comes running out toward me. My first instinct was to gun it. I thought, this crazy man, is, does he have a knife? I mean, what's he doing? But fortunately, I stopped. And he said, man, the road's out there, so I moved the barricade. I would have been in a hurt if I would not have stopped. Or that guy would not have came out. Right. You see, that's the way it is. When you see somebody heading in a direction like that, especially somebody who's not saved, they're heading to hell. We, we need to let them know you need Jesus. Amen. You need Jesus. You're heading in a direction of an eternity in hell. Now you've got to allow the Holy Spirit to guide you what to say and how to say it. But church, we, we need to tell people when they're heading in the wrong direction. But again, don't become the city police and think you've got to tell everybody everything you think they're doing wrong. But if you see that they're heading towards harm's way, I mean, if I find out a brother's, you know, watching pornography on, on the internet and I find out about it, I'm not just going to ignore it. I'm going to say, hey, brother, you know, this is going to get you all bound up. You need to start getting delivered from this now. You need to dip it in the bud. Amen? And I mean, that's a true thing because I don't know what the percentages are, but I know they're high, even in the church, of men that are addicted to pornography. And there's some women too. You see, that's something that needs to be addressed. Amen? Yeah. Now, am I going to get up and tell everybody, oh, brother, so and so's? No. I'm trying to restore them. I'm trying to, to, to save them by guiding them back into the light. Amen? Hallelujah. Let's move on. Acts 2.42 And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. The fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. 
I want to break these verses down and take a look at them this morning. It starts off saying, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Now, doctrine is just another way of saying teaching. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' teaching. Teaching is one of our priorities here at Crosswalk Fellowship. I want you to understand the Word of God. I'm not up here to entertain you. I'm here to hopefully impart His Word into your spirit. You may not always shout on Sunday morning, but I hope sometimes you might shout on Tuesday afternoon when God, the Holy Spirit, brings that back to your remembrance. I trust that you get into the Word personally throughout the week. I hope you don't depend just on this one meal a week any more than you would depend upon just a Sunday meal every week. I hope that you get into the Word every day and study the Scriptures, understand the Scriptures, but we come together here as a body to learn and are hopefully encouraged, edified, and challenged to some degree through the teaching and preaching of God's Word. Then we are to receive His Word, and here's the key point, look for ways to apply His Word in our lives. And that, church, is how the Holy Spirit works to bring us into maturity through His Word. Matter of fact, in Matthew 28, verse 20, it reads there, Jesus said, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. We are to teach the things that God has commanded. Amen? So we don't want to talk about commandments anymore, do we? But Jesus said we're to teach those things He's commanded us. He goes on to say, and fellowship. You know, fellowship is about more than chicken dinners. Although that's part of it. We can see the early church did a lot of things gathered around the meal. As you look back at it, they would meet, they would eat, and they would fellowship, they would listen to the apostles' teachings. But fellowship predominantly is about encouragement and edifying one another. You know, church really starts at 10 o'clock or even 9.30 for some of you. Just when you're sitting out there in the foyer or sitting out here and just sharing with one another. That fellowship can many times be just as encouraging as sitting there listening to me teach the Word. I don't think we're not going to teach the Word we're not going to fellowship for two hours every Sunday. <coughs> Unless God would lead us to, but it's part of it, amen? amen? You can share something with somebody that would just minister to them and, 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 and just help them tremendously. It's also a time that we can show our support for one another. You know, some people have the idea that church is all about me. I didn't get anything out of worship this morning. Well, I didn't get anything out of what pastor said this morning. Donuts weren't really that good this morning. All about me. If church, if you think church is all about you, then you're approaching church wrong. We come to give as much as we come to receive. You know, you're simply being here is showing support. You are missed when you're not here. I'm so glad Mike and Kay are here today for more reasons than one. I've shared this illustration before, but I'm going to go back to it. One of the first churches we pastored, not the first, but one of the first, we were in Boonville, Indiana. And we had a young man who had since gone to be with the Lord. I just think about how many people, you know, that I had relationships with that are with the Lord now. 
know, both him and his mom are with the Lord. His name was Doug Blackwood. And he attended our church. And Doug just had a winsome personality. You know, I'm going to tell you, Doug had some issues in his life. I mean, some major issues. But Doug had a heart for God. Kind of reminds me of David. You know, David sinned big, but he repented big. He praised God big. But he had a winsome personality, this Doug did. And Doug was a greeter at our church. And when people come in, he just had a laugh and a smile. <laughs> I can't even do it. You know, how are you doing? And I mean, he just made whoever he was talking to feel like they were the most important person on the earth. And that's just the vibe you got from Doug. And I remember one time we had a visitor that came a second time, and Doug wasn't there that day. Do you know that person felt like they missed a blessing? And you might say, oh, he's just shaking hands and greeting people. Sometimes that could be the most important job in the church. You know, they talk about first impressions. Hey, buddy, that's a first impression. When you walk in that door of what you see right there, that can set their attitude for the whole service. So being a greeter takes an anointing. It takes... Uh, uh, Take a responsibility and realize them that you have a part of it. Even if you're not the official greeter, you're all greeters. Amen? And anytime we are not at church, we can be robbing people of a blessing. It's so important. Our presence is very, very important. We are missed when we're not here. Regular church attendance. It's not a legalistic thing. It's a ministry thing. Amen? We're told not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some. You know, your church family needs you. Whether you know it or not, you have something to add to the body. Now, I understand. Don't get me wrong. We all take vacations. Things come up. I know Ron and Deb are out ministering. You know, I'm not talking about those kind of things. I'm talking about, eh, I don't think I'm going to go this morning. I'm going to stay home and watch the preacher on TV. Or, you know, I'm just going to take a day off or whatever. I, I, I still like old Keith Green's song. Jesus rose from the dead. And you can't even get out of bed. <laughs> saying is we need to make church a priority in our lives. That sends a positive message to your children. A positive message to your co-workers. To your neighbors. And to anyone that's watching your life when they see that church life is a priority in your life. Again, I want to share a couple of stories that I've shared, but hey, until you can approve on them. There's a dear brother. I'm, I'm not sure if he's alive today or not. I really I don't know. But Ralph Goodpastor is his name. It's an awesome name for a pastor, isn't it? Hi, I'm Goodpastor. Oh, you're kind of fooling yourself, aren't you? No, I'm Goodpastor. That's my name. Goodpastor. But uh, he was a great brother. And I think other than this church, we've had him in every church we've ever pastored to come and speak. And I may have, you may remember me talking about him. And I, I tried to reach him. I just, you know, I, I don't, I can't, I don't know. I know he was having some major health issues the last I heard, and that was six or seven years ago or more. So, he's, uh, passed, he's passed away, I think. He has passed away. I, I'm, I was assuming maybe he did, because I couldn't reach him in any way. But anyway, uh, brother, a uh, good pastor, um, you know, he, he was an evangelist, and he, he'd speak at places. But, you know, he would go to church every Wednesday night at his church. Every Wednesday night. And one time he didn't leave to go to church, and he had, I think it was like two neighbors came over to check on him because they knew of his commitment to going to church. Then there was a, 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 a lady, which some of you have met, uh, Minnie Brown, dear, dear, dear friend of ours. And I'm not going to go through the whole story for the sake of time, but you know she would always be at church a half hour earlier than anybody else. 
she would come in and pick up and pray. You know, she would like straighten things up and, and, and walk around the church and she would pray every Sunday. Well, one Sunday we came in, Minnie Brown wasn't there. And we got there early, but she would came in earlier. And the doors would be open, the air would be on, whatever, and she'd be picking things up and praying. She wasn't there. So, you know, Oh, that was odd. 10 o'clock rolls around. I started getting really concerned. Well, 10 15, it's like church starts at 10 30. We just happened to have a guest speaker that day. Long story short, I said, I'm going to go check on it. You see, that's commitment. I knew something. I said, she wasn't going to be there. It was to go see her son. And she would always call and say, Pastor, I'm going to go tear a hole and see my son this weekend. But other than that, I knew she'd be there. So when she wasn't there, I knew there was a problem. Now with a lot of folks, like all oh, they probably just didn't come to that. You know, so I wouldn't have any concern. But I wouldn't check on her. She had a stroke. She had it on Saturday. And we got her to the hospital and, 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 and so forth. But don't tell them, we were just talking about this the other day. Don't tell them how long she would have been there if it wasn't for the fact that I knew something was wrong because I knew her commitment to her church family. Amen. You may have heard this before. Well, I'd rather be golfing and thinking about God than in church thinking about golfing or put your sport in there. Well, if you're in church thinking about golfing or fishing or whatever it might be, you don't have your priorities right. You don't have your heart right. He didn't just say that, did he? <laughs> yes, I did. You know, if you're sitting in church and you're thinking about, oh, I'd rather be doing this or rather be doing that, there's a good chance you just got a dose of religion. Because if your heart was right... You'd be excited about coming to church. You'd be excited about singing praises to God. You'd be excited about having fellowship with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen. Say amen or ouch or something. <laughs> then he goes on to say, breaking of bread. Although this could be talking about chicken dinners, I... I think maybe he's talking more about communion or the Lord's Supper when it talks about breaking bread. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning with verse 24, it reads, And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. We are to participate in communion, the Lord's Supper, together remembering what he has done for us. Do you realize that He loved us while we were yet sinners? He loved us when we were haters of God, enemies of God. He gave His life for us. He forgave us. He healed us, redeemed us, saved us, and delivered us and reconciled us to Himself. That's what we remember when we take the Lord's Supper together. We partake here at Crosswalk Fellowship of the Lord's Supper once a month. The first Sunday of the month. Now I'm not sure what the word often refers to, but for now, to us, that means once a month. As a matter of fact, as you can see, here shortly we're going to have communion together. In Matthew 21, 13, it says, 
Jesus said, and my house should be called a house of prayer. Well, in Acts it says they also met together for prayer, in prayers. Personally, I would like to see Crosswalk Fellowship engage more in prayer than what we are. Prayer is a very important part of our fellowship. We pray and set, a top, set aside a time every Sunday morning to pray. I believe that's very important. And we can see that's very important by the fact of what we just see, saw happen. And like Cheryl said, we need to believe that's our prayers that did that. I was telling where I, where I uh, help clean and, and work at part-time during the week uh, church here in Evansville. I was talking to the pastor and every once in a while we'll get to sharing. And I was talking about, and I was sharing that testimony about Amy with him. And uh, he said, well, it sounds like you really have a powerful prayer ministry there. And then the thought hit me like, See, does he think I'm bragging or, you know, or boasting or because I didn't really mean it that way. And I said, well, okay, I did two things. I said, well, there was a lot of people praying. But then I, I caught myself. And like Cheryl said, if you're going to pray, you better be praying believing that that's what's going to make a difference. So I said, of course, when we pray, we do believe it was our prayers that made the difference because we pray believing that would happen. Now, he's Methodist. So I don't know how he interprets all of that. But at the same time, that's how you pray. When you pray for somebody, they get into it. That's my prayer. Not that you're anything because, again, remember, we're garden hoses. But no, that's the Holy Spirit falling through my garden hose. Amen? Because you want to pray believing. That's the kind of prayers that get answered. If you're not praying believing, don't bother praying. The prayer of faith shall save the sick. That's not boasting. That's not bragging. That's just saying you believe what the Word of God says. That when you pray or you lay hands or whatever it is that you do, that it shall come to pass. That you'll see the manifestation of God's power working through you because you believe. So prayer is a very important part of Crosswalk Fellowship. I trust that everyone here prays during the course of the week. I know you pray for your pastor and his family. Amen? Amen. You better be. I need it. We need it. Amen? You know, Mike and I pray weekly for the church and things abroad. You're often lifted up by us, you know, especially when we know that you have needs. It used to be Tuesdays. We kind of changed it to different days. Or actually, Tuesday evenings now that we're meeting. We're praying concerning the decisions that we make on behalf of the church. And Tom joins us when his schedule will allow him to join us. Which his schedule, we need to pray about it because now they got him working until 7 o'clock at night. What's up with that? But prayer is important. One man said, and again, I've heard these things for years, I can't remember who said it, but I'll try to give credit here. But someone said it. Prayer is a foundation for every successful endeavor. We need to have a foundation of prayer. Wonders and signs. Oh, let me back up a minute. Verse 43. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Wonders and signs are also intended to be part of church life. Whether that be, we just saw a wonder. I don't know how you explain that, or a miracle, or other than God, I mean, that's the only way I think you can explain that. I mean, they themselves at the hospital said they'd never seen that before. That tells you something. They see a lot of sick people. They've never seen that before. Wonders and signs are intended to be a part. Whether it's somebody getting saved, somebody getting delivered, somebody getting ill, whatever it might be, we should expect Wonder signs, miracles. And we'll get into that more next week and later on in our study. Verse 44. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. Let me just add here, this is not suggesting communal living. Well, let's just all bring everything we have, throw it in the pot, and share everything. 
The Bible recognizes the right to personal property. Okay? This is a special time. There were thousands and thousands of people from out of town. This was a, there was a great revival going on. In order to sustain everybody, sacrifices were made. And everybody sacrificed. And people were willing to make sacrifices. But the key word here is willing. They weren't made to. We're not commanded to share the wealth. Amen? Now, again, they weren't forced to. So also, oh, good. Praise God. That means I don't have to give anybody anything. You know, sometimes, you know, there are some people who don't believe in tithing. And, and, you know, I say that's okay. I think you don't believe in tithing. I, I think tithing is just the starting point anyway. You know, 10%, I think that's just the starting point. If, you know, it's what you're giving is you've been blessed, but how have you been blessed? You know? Not how much debt do you have, but how have you been blessed? Okay, give accordingly. Well, I think that's going to be at least 10%. So... But you know, if we're looking at how, how little we can get by with, we got the wrong attitude anyway. And I won't say any more about that right now. Now let's move on. I'm almost done. Now, all that being said, we are to apply this to our lives. We're to be generous. We're not commanded to sell everything and give give, you know, share it with everybody. We're not commanded to do that, but we need to be generous. Now, that being said, that does not mean we're to enable lazy people that can work but won't work. You know, we're not have to give to people who think everybody owes them a living. There are legitimate needs, and when we are able to meet those needs, and, uh, and it's a legitimate need, yes, we, we, we ought to share, we ought to give, we ought to help. We ought to do so with gladness of heart. Amen? So it does apply to us. Verse 46. So continuing daily in one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people the Lord added to the church daily, those who were being saved. The last point I want to make and the Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. He doesn't come out and say they're committed to evangelism, but we do know that to be the case because that is a New Testament principle and we see people getting saved. Amen? Daily, we see people getting saved. There's a multiplication of people being saved. It says they were added to the church daily, those that were being saved. As a local church, we had the responsibility of sharing the good news of Christ. And I simply want to say this. If you do not feel prepared to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, you come see me and I will be glad to sit down with you and show you how to do that. I don't, you should not have an excuse not to be able to tell somebody about Christ. If you haven't got enough of what I say up here, let me know and I will sit down we'll just uh, get a cup of coffee or whatever or, or, and, and I'll just share with you and show you how you can lead somebody to Christ and tell them about Christ. And if you're here this morning and you're not certain you're born again, see me for that too. Amen? And we'll make sure you can leave here knowing that you're born again. Amen? Would you stand with me? You know, I'm giving a very... Uh, Old altar call nowadays. I sit there and look at you and tell you that if you don't know for certain that you have a relationship with Christ, with everybody looking around, every eye open, I'm going to ask you to just lift your hand. And I'll pray with you. We'll pray with you. And you can leave here knowing that you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. The pastor, that's hard to do. We know it's hard for Jesus to go to the cross too. 
Everybody was watching him, weren't they? And, and coming to know Christ, it's not, there's nothing embarrassing about it. I guarantee you, there would not be anybody in this room that would do nothing but rejoice in that decision. I'm not asking you, you know, how long you've been coming to Crosswalk Fellowship, because I believe your life's been coming here a long time. But do you know that you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Do you know that you have a relationship? If you, if you can't say yes to that, just, and you want to, just lift your hand real quick. We're not going to carry. You know, I'm assuming we all know Christ, but you know, I don't know everything. Anybody at all? Okay. So if you decide later you want to pray about it or talk about it, see me. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for this morning. We thank you for your word. I pray, God, that you would help us to receive the word given and uh, minister it to us, Lord, and help us to apply everything that you've shown us this morning. And Lord, we're careful to give you all the praise and all the glory. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. And let me just.